and the oats are sometimes referred to as cyclostomata are organisms which lack a proper jaw. So that is the most significant difference between the organisms and the true fish. We know that fish have a mouth with jaws which look like this. But the organisms belonging to the subphylum Agnatha have a round mouth with rings of cartilage. These rings have saw like structures arranged in rows that act as teeth. The organisms have a skull or cranium, but a proper spinal cord is absent. Another remarkable difference is their skin. They do not have scales on their body. Instead, the skin is quite smooth. There are tiny pores on the sides, usually seven in number. Most of these are employed for breathing. An interesting strategy used by some of them, like the hagfish, is that they secrete some slimy mucus as a part of a defense mechanism. Not just for their defense, but also when the hagfish is enjoying its meal, it usually secretes a lot of mucus to keep the other fish from attacking their meal. Now the next question would be, what do these hagfish or other agnatha eat? What is their meal composed of? Most of them are detritivores, which means they rely largely on dead organisms. They have quite a developed digestive system, but it lacks a proper stomach. The gut is more or less a uniform tube-like structure throughout. But their main advantage is the slow rate of metabolism. If the temperature around the organism drops below expected, then the slow rate of metabolism enables it to stay alive without eating food for days together. Lastly, the fertilization in these organisms is external. The lamprey larvae are extremely tiny and mostly live in fresh water or muddy water. So, this was briefly the subphylum Agnatha. Which is the next subphylum in our list? The close relatives of these organisms, which we just had a look at. That's right, it's the subphylum Pisces. Fish dominate the oceans and other water bodies in many ways. Right from their sizes to their numbers, they outrange most other aquatic life forms. What are the characteristics of Pisces which make them so unique and different from other aquatic creatures? To start, what does a fish look like? This is the typical body structure of a fish. Mark its shape. This tapering ends and bulge center makes the body very streamlined. What's the significance of this shape? Quite simple. It helps the body to cut through the force of water. That's the reason why we join our hands and take this posture before we dive in water. The body of fish can have a proper bony skeleton or in some cases, the endoskeleton is made up of cartilage. Sharks are an example of the fish that have cartilaginous skeletons. Codfish, tuna and salmon are a few examples of bony fish. The body of most fish is bilaterally symmetrical and is triploblastic. Their body has scales and the appendages are reduced to fins that help them in swimming. The change in direction is aided by a single caudal fin in most of the fish. Fish have a well-developed digestive system. Many other systems are also quite developed and well adapted to survive in water. For example, the respiratory system is so advanced that it helps in taking in the dissolved oxygen from water, which is very less compared to the oxygen in the air. The respiration occurs with the help of gills present internally on either side. Water is taken in through the mouth and given out through the gills. The counter current mechanisms help in taking in the dissolved oxygen from the water. So, this was about respiration. Now, what about nervous system? Is it well developed? Fish possess an amazing developed brain. Most of their senses and systems are coordinated by their brain located in the head region. The circulatory system in fish is also pretty well developed. Fish have a two chambered heart. Blood vessels run through their bodies. And lastly, reproduction. Sexes in fish are separate. Fertilization can be both internal as well as external depending upon the species. This was about the first two subphyla of the major phylum vertebrata from the chordates. There are a few organisms which show a unique ability to live on land as well as in water. And with 
search for Canism nuttings? Let's look at this interesting subphylum. The subphylum is called amphibia and the organisms included are known as amphibians. The name comes from the ancient Greek term amphibios, which means of both lives. So do these organisms have two lives? No, they don't. It just means that they can live their life in two different habitats equally well. Let's think of food as a representative of this category. Frogs lay their eggs in water. These develop into tadpoles. The tadpoles swim and live in the surrounding water. Once they grow into the adult frogs, they come out of the water and start living in a terrestrial habitat. That means some part of their life is mandatorily spent in water and some on land. Imagine if they have to spend one complete day or even half a day in water. Would that be possible? Well, if we were given all that we need, then it may not seem a difficult task. However, the biggest challenge is the supply of oxygen. Everything else can be managed for a day. But we haven't seen any frog carrying an oxygen cylinder. So how do they manage their oxygen requirement? Well, the simple answer is their adaptation. Frogs and even other amphibians have a specialized respiratory system. When on land, they can breathe through their lungs, but when in water, they carry out gaseous exchange through their skin. That's their speciality. Their skin is usually soft, skinless, and moist. And what about the other systems in the body? The other organs are also quite well developed. The digestive system is a complete one that begins at the mouth and ends at the anus. The excretory system is also well developed. It has a pair of kidneys and a complete urinary system. What about the nervous system? That also seems pretty well developed. Amphibians have a small brain located in the head region, a spinal cord and nerves running all over the body which carry messages. And lastly, let's talk about the reproductive system of amphibians. The sexes are separate. Females are sometimes larger in size compared to the males, and that is how they can be easily identified. Fertilization is usually external. In the case of frogs, for example, the eggs are released in the water by the female, which get fertilized by the floating sperms released nearby. The fertilization results in formation of small embryos, which stick together to form a mass with jelly-like covering. The tadpoles on development get released in water and survive as herbivores. Up until these stages, the morphology, which is the study of the external characteristics, are as seen here. But after this stage, there is a unique phenomenon that occurs. Metamorphosis. It's exactly what happens when a tadpole changes into an adult frog. That is why the tadpole and the adult frog look so strikingly different. A more or less similar story is seen in the other amphibians as well. Can you spot a fewer examples of amphibians? Apart from all types of frogs, we have the regular salamanders, torrent salamanders, amphiuma, and many others on the list. You may say even crocodiles are amphibians as they live on land as well as in water. That's not the case. Crocodiles are not amphibians. They are reptiles. That's the subphylum we need to look at after amphibians. So what exactly are reptiles? Which organisms are included in this list? How are they different from the amphibians? Let's find out. Animals ranging from crocodiles to turtles, comedians to snakes, all are reptiles. Although most of the reptiles spend most of their time in water, they are very much different from amphibians. The first and most important difference is the skin. Reptiles have a rough, dry and scaly skin in contrast to the smooth and the moist skin of the amphibians. Also, reptiles are metadactyl, which means having five fingers or toes but without joints. So all the five fingers or toes are separate from each other. Some even have claws as a part of defense and attack. Reptiles, being on the higher side of the evolutionary scale, possess well-developed systems. The digestive system of reptiles is well-developed with a proper mouth, esophagus in most of them, a well-developed stomach, intestines,
assistant and ends at the anus. Similarly, even the excretory system is well developed. Supported by a pair of kidneys, reptiles have a complete excretory system that helps in eliminating the harmful nitrogenous wastes from their body. Next comes the respiratory system. A pair of lungs help in breathing on the land. What about those in the water? In such cases, like the crocodiles who spend most of the time underwater, the animal is capable of holding its breath for quite a long time. So they breathe when on land and hold their breath underwater. Now, can you tell me how exactly the nervous system in the reptiles is? Reptiles have a central nervous system consisting of a less developed brain, a spinal cord and nerves that run throughout the body. Lastly, reptiles also have separate sexes and the mode of reproduction is sexual reproduction. The fertilization in most of them is internal. However, reptiles are mostly oviparous, which means egg-laying. The eggs of reptiles are typically soft and leathery. All the nutrients required for the growth of the embryo are present in the yolk sac that surrounds the embryo. Once hatched, the young reptiles start living their independent lives. Now this was about the amphibians and the reptiles that belong to the phylum vertebrata from the chordates. We will look at the remaining from our list in the next video.